Hi, everybody. Uh, Matt Lippman, Executive Director of 97%, as you may know, back again. Uh, we have an incredible panel, but first I have to just say to Jessica Yellen in that panel, that was fantastic. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jessica has an Instagram page called News Not Noise, which has hundreds of thousands of followers. I'm one of them. It's where I get a lot of my news. She conducts a lot of interviews. And you can see by how well she did that interview session with people coming in and out that she's a real professional and she's terrific. So News Not Noise, go to it on Instagram. Uh, I think there's something like 600,000 people who get their news from Jessica. Um, so uh, appreciate it, Jessica. That was a really informative panel. Uh, and so now we turn it over to this panel about new ideas on gun safety. So I, um, in case you're wondering where I am, I'm here in North Carolina. Uh, I spoke to Professor David Yamane's class at Wake Forest yesterday, and he's got an incredible uh, group of students that he speaks with about gun issues. It's a very unique class. And these students are very informed on gun issues and mental health issues. And they're looking for solutions. This is a generation. This is what we often call the Parkland generation. And they're looking for solutions. And we try to provide some of those and lots of organizations do. Uh, but there are some of those that we have not yet worked on ourselves or haven't thought of and others have, and they're working on this on a daily basis. And so we're gonna bring you a few of those people. Secretary Arnie Duncan in Chicago will, is gonna be first. Then we're gonna have Emily Amick from, who's an activist with an Instagram page called Emily in your phone. Then we're gonna have Rob Pincus from ICE Training. And we're gonna have Timmy O from Vera uh, Gun Safety, gun which makes a safe, a gun safe, that looks like a holster and uses smart technology. It's pretty amazing. So uh, we're going to start out, though, with Secretary Duncan. Secretary Duncan, you're on with us. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank so Secretary Duncan, um, you are a Chicago person through and through. And you have uh, Chicago CRED, which is working on this issue. CRED is an acronym for? Creating Real Economic Destiny. And you can't create economic destiny if you're not, um, if you have to be able to survive and have less gun violence in Chicago to be able to create that economic destiny, right? Correct. And we're working, I'm actually on the South side now here in Rosen, but we're working with the young men and women, most at risk of shooting and being shot, uh, who are caught in these cycles of violence. And we've been at it six years, learned a lot of <laughs> really hard, important lessons. But in the neighborhood where I'm at now, we're down about 36% in terms of violence this year. And on the west side, where we're also deep in North London, we're down about 46%. So a uh, lot more work to do, but just incredibly proud of our team. And most importantly, incredibly proud of our participants who are putting down the guns and deciding to do something very different with their lives because of the support and the opportunities they have. So I'm going to stay on with you, Secretary, but tell us, because people don't know about outside of Chicago. I don't think people know nationally about the incredible, incredible work you're doing. So maybe you could tell us how and why you started this, what's going on in Chicago, and then more specifically about what it is that you're doing. Sure, I'll try, try and keep it brief. And uh, unfortunately, gun, you know, growing up here, gun violence is something that has haunted me my entire life. I lost friends and I was a teenager growing up playing basketball on the South and West sides. And when I ran the Chicago public schools for seven years before going to DC, lots I'm proud of, but during that time, uh, very tragically, we lost a child on average every two weeks due to gun violence here in the city. It's just a devastating you know, amount of loss. And 99% of times I was meeting you know, family members, parents. My wife and I had two young kids at that point after they had lost their child. And so I don't think I know we as whatever we were, adults, educators, leaders, parents, we failed to keep our kids safe. And coming back here to Chicago, this felt like the crisis facing the city. Chicago is six times more violent than New York, three to four times more violent than L.A. We had the anomaly, and it's not our kids' fault. It's our fault, and we have to do better. And just listening to your previous panel, I thought a lot about going into the gun policy space. Um, just was a little worried about the, the time frame there and just knowing the loss of life here daily. And so we need that policy. We need that air cover. Um, I knew that was a more of a long-term play. What I knew on a short, more short-term basis, more immediate basis, what I could control as a private citizen, or have, I don't say control, have impact on, is I could get people who were caught in cycles of gun violence, who are carrying guns, to put those guns down if we created some hope and opportunity. So we've worked with now over 1,000 uh, men and women. We have folks who sort of transitioned them from the street economy to the legal economy. We have street outreach teams. We have clinicians who say that 
hurt people hurt people, but people that are healed can heal not just themselves, but their families and, and the community. We have life coaches who say experience is the best teacher. It doesn't have to be your own experience. And many of our life coaches, unfortunately, serve you know, 20, 30 years in prison, but have come out and dedicated their lives to giving back. And just seeing our, our young people be able to make very different choices because they have very different opportunities. It's the hardest work I've ever done. It's honestly the most heartbreaking, but it's also the most inspiring. People often say oh, it's great giving people a second chance. They actually reject that. I think in, in the vast majority of cases, we're actually given a first chance that every institution in their lives, family, school, church, community, failed them. And we're giving them a chance to move in a different direction. It is a big undertaking to decide that you're going to come back to Chicago. You were in D.C. for what, six years or so? Seven That's years? Seven. Yeah, yeah. And go back and tackle gun violence, which is a very obviously a very difficult issue. That that's what you're going to devote yourself to. So when you start this secretary, you have to raise money for the organization and do all that. And then and you have to go out and do all that. That's very difficult to even just start it to get people involved to know. I mean, your level of success is so tremendous. You're like you said, you're saving lives. But even to start it, that takes a lot of gumption for is a proper word. Well, a lot of naivety. And like I said, we're making 50 mistakes a day. We're probably making 48 mistakes a day today. But we we, we co-design, we co-create with our men and women. I always say they're, they're, they're men and women. They're not little kids. And the last thing I want to do is waste a second of their time. So every day we're checking what's working, what's not, what do we need to do more of? And just getting that constant feedback and, and input, um, whatever success we've had, it's because of their, their leadership, their commitment to doing something very different. And for, for us to get to a better place, we all have to move outside our comfort zones. And I've definitely had to do that and take on some risk that is, uh, is difficult at time, honestly, and some fear. But I promise you the, the changes in the, in, their, in the lifestyles, the changes in the choices, the changes in the decisions that our participants are making, they are moving way further, way farther outside of their comfort zones than, than me or any of my team. And just have just incredible admiration for them. I say all the time, they they are the solution to the problem. They're not the problem. They're, they are going to lead us. They are leading us to a safer city. And then, so in terms of the difference that you've been able to make, this is obviously a unique thing that you're doing, Secretary Duncan. Do you see this? I don't want to give you more work than you already have, but do you see this as unique to Chicago? You have a, a very significant gun violence situation there or do you see this as a model that could work possibly in other places as well yeah it the violence here unfortunately is uniquely bad but is obviously not unique and you go to any you know urban area they have their challenges so we're helping folks in dc think about this we're helping folks in in memphis Nash, nashville reached out and they can learn from from our successes they can learn from our mistakes and leapfrog over that we're going to you know co-create with them and so it's just, uh, we can all learn together. We're all in this together. It's the last thing for competition. We all, we all want to um, just, I just want kids to be able to grow up free of fear and trauma. Our, our saying is we work so our kids can play. It's really that at the end of the day, it's that simple. Is there, we have a big audience here today, Secretary Duncan. Is there anything that people can do to be supportive of you in Chicago? Um, love, we have a website, just Chicago Cred, you know, www.chicagocred.com. You know, please check us out. And um, I, it's so important to be proximate. So if folks you know, want to come and visit, I have a guest with me here today. You know, we have people down all the time and it's just, it cuts through all the stereotypes, cuts through all the mess and just to see how hard these men and women are, are working. It's, it's, uh, it's actually transformative to witness their transformation and we encourage people to take a look if they have questions or want more information, please just give me a holler. We'd love to, love to continue the conversation. Fantastic. So go save lives. Stop talking to me. Go save some lives. And uh, really, Secretary, appreciate the work you're doing is incredible and appreciate the time. Thank no, you. Thanks. Okay. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thanks. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, okay, so next up, we have Emily Amick. And so for those of you who don't know, Emily worked, Emily, you worked in the um, Senate side, right? I did, yeah. You worked for Schumer? I did. I was counsel, Judiciary Committee counsel to Senator Schumer, Leader Schumer. And then you have currently, I'm going to make sure I'm getting this right. Are you representing families that are victims of terrorism abroad? Am I saying this correctly? I yeah. Just... So I represent American victims of terrorism um, uh, and sue state sponsors of terror. So places like Iran, Syria, and then the financial institutions that launder money for them. And then somehow you've also started Emily in your phone on Instagram, which you have over 100,000 people following you and finding out how to be active from you 
whether it's on gun issues or Taylor Swift tickets? Yeah, you know, we do it all at EYP, Emily and your phone. It started out pretty much like a Dogstagram account, just because I have adorable dogs, as uh, I hope everyone uh, appreciates. And uh, it quickly evolved into this rather big thing. It's a really fun place to get uh, a lot of folks politically active, a lot of people for the first time. And, uh, you know, these midterms really galvanized people and, and we're ready to keep it going. So just before we even get into the gun issues, how did people even figure out how to follow you on Instagram? Is it all just word of mouth? You're, you're doing a lot. There are a lot of issues that you're covering. How does that even work? How do you yeah. even have the... So it's only word of mouth. It's pretty much people either telling their friends uh, to follow me or people posting, reposting my stuff on Instagram and someone saying like, follow this gal. She she has some interesting thoughts to share. And you're getting significant, not just a significant following, but people to actually be active. Is that right? Yeah. I have a really high engagement level. So I'll have, you know, 50 to 75% of my followers looking at my posts, um, which is a huge percentage, right? So I'll po I posted about the Taylor Swift tickets issue, which is a really about breaking up monopolies issue. Uh, and it has already 90,000 views on the post. And I know people, what people do is and they, they take my scripts and they call Congress. So uh, last time I did a little survey, I was driving about 4,000 calls a day to Congress. That's so it, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of women and I tell them to put, put, you know, put their members of Congress phone numbers, save them in their phone. And, you know, you're in the grocery line and just make a call to one of your besties, your uh, senator. And do you think, by the way, that that's an effective thing for people to do, making those phone calls? I do. You know, look, there's lots of different ways to affect change in Congress. And um, I think this is, I mean, these offices hear this. And a big thing is, Often what they hear are people who are mad, right? Like people who, it's a lot of the NRA, it's a lot of people who are no, 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 no. Because my followers are busy putting food on the table, taking their kids to soccer, right? Like they just want reasonable reform. And that isn't something you get excited about and make calls. So this helps sort of change the member's perception of where their community is. Um, and it's also a way for people to start to get engaged in politics, which I think has been a really meaningful sort of entry point for a lot of people. So when you say, how do you know where your followers are on these issues? In other words, they write to you on Instagram and say, I'm going to do what you said. But how do you know? How do you have a sense of where? Because you have a lot of people following you. So when you post something about an issue. It's what I think. <laughs> That's the answer. I think you froze. Oh, I think you froze. Um, what I said is, you know, it's what I think, right? So I do collect feedback from people, but at the end of the day, it's my platform. And I'm going to put forward ideas that I've developed after working in this field for 15 years. Um, and so I try, I think that sometimes people in politics have a tendency to be reactive and I try to be more proactive. So let's talk about this, Emily, specifically as it relates to the gun issue. And the reason that I first got to know you is because you wrote about 97% on your Instagram page. So tell me where you think your followers are in the gun issue. And then let's talk about what you think people can do that maybe some people haven't thought of. Sure. So I would say this is the most important issue to my followers. This is more yeah. important than choice. This wow. is more important than inflation. This is the most important issue. They, they think their children are gonna be shot in school. Nothing else compares to that. Um, so they want change and they want it to happen now. Uh, and I don't think that it's, I mean, assault weapon ban is obviously something that galvanizes people to a significant degree, but I think that they're interested in going where the movement leads them um, and what they want is change. And when we say where the movement leads them, what's where we, in other words, one thing we talk about, Emily, is gun owners are not in favor of an assault weapons ban, which makes it very difficult to have an assault weapons ban, right? Because only mm -hmm. one third of gun owners favor it. About 100 million people in the United States are gun owners, so that would be very tough to do. Uh, there are other issues around guns that your followers talk about that they want to advocate for. So we were really big in support of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Um, so I think that, that everything that was in that bill is really important. But you know, moving forward, 
I think it's a really important conversation is what's attainable. And I agree, assault weapon ban is a deeply, uh, it's a culture war issue at this point. And those types of issues are extremely hard to break uh, until we can break a filibuster and have a democratic majority in the house, right? Um, so I think background checks are really important. I know I have like one minute left. So I had no, a couple- no, Go ahead, go ahead. I had a couple other ideas, um, new ideas. Of course, background checks, closing the background check loopholes, number one important banner issue, in my opinion, all of them more than mentioned to me, in my opinion. But when you say closing the background and check loopholes, do you also mean just having universal background checks? Universal well? background checks. Okay. Yeah. So, but gun shows, uh, private sales. I want the fam familial gift loophole closed. I know that that is not supported by other people, but I certainly do. I think you have you should have to go through a background check. Um, but, you know, I think another important thing that we need to start talking about is modernizing NICS. And uh, that's the National Instant Criminal Background Checks in, uh, System that is run by the FBI. There's been a lot of changes over the past five or six years. Obama did a lot. Um, there's still a lot more to go, specifically implementation of the Safer Communities Act, right? It says we need to have all of these juvenile records and mental health records for, you know, young people 18 to 21, but we don't have a system to get those records into NICS. That really needs to be a big investment, but I want to see this as part of a broader modernization effort. So also focusing on getting these domestic violence records in. There's a lot of domestic violence records uh, missing. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of that I worked on when I was in the Congress was I was the original staffer on Fix NICS. That was my original idea. And the idea was to try to promote uh, states to give them a carrot and a stick to get more carrots for them to put in these records. It's not enough. Uh, we still are missing a lot of those records. Um, well, let me ask you this, Emily. Yeah. If, if you had the records, if the state did the background checks instead of the federal government, you'd mm -hmm. find those records that you're talking about more easily, probably. Is that right? I mean, that's assuming you trust the states to do it. So it works in places like Connecticut. Say that um, again, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that theoretically, yes, assuming you trusted the states to do it. Yeah. Um, so it work in some place like Connecticut where it does work. Uh, I would not, if I was a domestic violence victim in Texas, I would not be, uh, I would not feel secure. So uh, the unique thing though, about what you're able to do is if you have these ideas, you're able to promote them to over a hundred thousand activists because they're activists otherwise they wouldn't be following you because that's what your page is right so that's the unique thing so i just want to say uh first emily thank you it's great to see you again uh, and the work that you're doing so if people want to follow you and want to be active on this or other issues it's emily in your phone like as one word right yeah on instagram and that's that's the way that that's it right and that's then you the tell people here's mean. what you here's what you could do and then they go do it it's true <laughs> you're a big influence. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you for joining us yeah. today. And all the work you're doing Thanks. is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to be joined by Rob Pincus of Ice Train. Rob, there you are. Hi, Where are you? Today? I am. I am in Prague. I'm getting ready to uh, to finish up a great panel. I'm sure it's been uh, educational and interesting so far. And then I'm going to go grab dinner. Okay. What time is it? Uh, it's coming up on uh, eight o'clock. Okay. Uh, Rob, thank you for joining us. We've talked before. First, tell folks so they know what ICE training is. Yeah, ICE training company was founded in 2001 uh, to help people be better prepared to defend themselves or others with firearms. And we primarily focused on armed professional training. Um, I left full-time law enforcement work to do educational work full-time in 2001. Uh, military, law enforcement, armed professionals um, had done some training and certainly a lot of education work uh, through writing in magazines, things like that in the private sector. And by the end of the 2000s had transitioned to focus primarily on the individual gun owner. Um, we still do a lot of work for the armed professionals, but um, as concealed carry especially grew in, in practice and popularity in the gun community, as we've had more and more new gun owners come in, um, realizing how important it is to educate them about what responsible gun ownership is, um, and of course, prepare them to, to use those guns in the worst case scenarios that uh, are motivating them primarily to own the guns um, is important as well. Rob, I, by the way, I say ICE, but should I say ICE? We say ICE. It stands for integrity, consistency, and efficiency. Um, and, and so, so that the words um, are more than just words; they mean a lot to the core uh, program and to our instructors all over the world. And uh, so, we do say ICE, and it also keeps us from getting confused with a government agency. 
Right, right, right. Um, Rob, you know, one thing that we try to do, and I think you know this is bring people together who don't normally agree on everything, right? So, you know, for example, your views are probably very different than the person we just had on. Right. Emily. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, and and listening here, you know, obviously Emily is focused on on p getting people motivated and focused on what she feels are the important issues. I love that she said, you know, they're my views. She's sharing her views. Uh, I certainly I share my views. Uh, I share the views in in that I'm the executive vice president of the Second Amendment organization. I talk about the organization's views as well. Um, but the work that she's doing is, is important because it, it really is about education and making sure people understand what. Um, anyone's trying to do. And, and I think even for gun owners, you know, it's important that we all sit down at this table or these types of tables, listen to what the quote unquote other side is saying and what they want to do and maybe point out where we don't think it'll work or why we're resistant to it. Or in some cases, we may find some common ground. Yeah. And, and thank you, Rob. And so tell us, for example, what is it that a lot of us have not thought of that can keep people, you do a lot of training, which is incredibly important in gun safety, obviously, you know, 100 million gun owners, and you're one of the leaders in the country, and now I guess the world on uh, on gun training uh, and gun safety. Tell us what some of us have not thought of about the great work that you're doing on safety, so people are aware of what you're doing and what you think works to keep people safer. Well, it's certainly not just me. I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of organizations out there, some of which are, are are known for probably other work that they do and not so much the education and responsibility, the safety work that they do in the background, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, for example, Second Amendment Foundation. Um, we know that we know the first one is a lobbying group that protects the gun industry and fights for the rights of the industry. Um, we know the second one is as the Second Amendment Foundation as an organization that fights in the courts to to especially um, you know get overturned or, or get at least um, investigations from the the courts into whether things are constitutional or not and try to regain some lost rights. But both of those organizations, along with my company and 2AO and countless other organizations are incredibly heavily involved in promoting gun owner responsibility. And, and I don't know that it's something anyone needs to know um, as much as accept. Uh, accepting this 100 million gun owners, accepting 400 plus million guns, and this is just the US. As you said, I've, I've worked in Europe since 2006. Um, we, we have a, a large program going for firearm safety for private gun owners in Mexico that we've actually put a lot of energy into this year. Um, reducing negative outcomes involving guns is about, in, in many cases, especially the suicide case, protecting gun owners and our families. So the amount of work that gets done inside of the community and inside of the industry and by the industry and, you know, Vera Safety is coming up, a perfect example of a newcomer to the industry that sole purpose is to prevent negative outcomes involving guns, you know, and still let someone have quick access to a gun when they need it. So I think that to me is the big thing is accepting how much work we're doing, maybe acknowledging it. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, that comes, I guess, with accepting the reality of those 400 million guns. It comes with accepting the reality of the 100 million gun owners that, that were not going away at the panel before ours. Um, some, of, some of the people talked about how there just aren't enough votes to do certain things that some people might like to do. Whether they're good ideas or not, accepting that and finding ideas that are even feasible um, is probably important. And you talked, Rob, for a second there about suicides. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Congresswoman Dean, who I, I know you were listening to that as well, was talking about the fact that I think she said 55% of deaths a year with a gun or suicides. If somebody tries to commit suicide with a gun, they're likely going to succeed. If they try any other way, they're likely not. So when you mention that, is that part of how is that work in terms of training? You mentioned Absolutely. So I'm, I'm on the board of Walk the Talk America. And in fact, um, Vera Safety is going to come up here. They're a big supporter also, and we're a yeah, mutual Michael supporter Sadini. of each other. Uh, with Mike Sedini, right? So, so on uh, the, the the Walk Talk America works at the intersection of guns and mental health to reduce negative outcomes. And obviously, the number one issue is suicide. And once again, it's gun owners and gun owners' families that are most affected by that. Um, and we, so we talk about things like um, cause a pause is one of our programs. You know, put a put a picture of someone or something you care about on your gun safe. And if you are in that impulsive moment, you're in a desperate moment. Uh, you feel like all hope is lost, or you're too much of a burden to other people. You're going to they make a tragic decision that, as you said, you can't take back um, in, in almost every case with a firearm. Maybe it, it causes a pause. Um, we also have the Gun Pro program, the Pledge of Responsible Ownership. People can learn about that at gunpropledge.org, uh, where you get together with two other gun owners uh, privately and, and, and individually, and you say, we are going to support each other in three simple things, the Pledge of Responsible Ownership, 
getting education in the safe and appropriate use of our firearms, whatever the endeavor we want to get into might be, uh, making sure that we're preventing unauthorized access, taking steps to prevent authorized access, which I think is the number one responsibility for all gun owners, remembering also that sometimes we're the ones that shouldn't have immediate access. You know, for example, I don't I don't go anywhere near my guns while I'm drinking, you know, just like I wouldn't drive when I'm drinking. In fact, I'm probably, you know, I might have one drink with dinner and drive. I won't carry a gun on a night when I'm drinking, but I carry a gun, you know, 250 days a year. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that, that these these responsible ownership ideas are something that we promote. It's something that everyone should be promoting, including the, the gun control organizations. Um, and yet we see them distance themselves from even the idea that gun owners can be responsible. And the third piece of the pledge, of course, is mental proactive mental health care um, and realizing that there are times, usually temporarily, when we should remove access to firearms because of mental health issues that we need to have addressed. Rob, you're such an eloquent spokesperson, so sort of off topic, but what are we missing when we talk, for, for people who don't own guns, when you hear people who don't own guns who have never been around guns, what are we missing in the conversation for people who have not been around it? Is it, is it that they stereotype, that stereotypes are too frequent? Is that what's missing in the gun conversation? Yeah, I mean, the, the technical term is cultural competency. Right. And, and we work inside of the mental health community, for example, to educate mental health professionals in the culture of gun owners and help them to understand. They don't have to think gun ownership is a great idea. They don't have to own guns themselves. They don't have to be gun owners, but they need to be conversant and, and understanding and, and I guess and empathetic to the perspectives of gun owners. Now, we talk about stereotypes and we, we, we can't too broadly generalize, but just the simple fact that gun ownership is, is a legitimate and not ridiculous thing to be engaged in, right? The simple fact that gun ownership is a protected civil right in the United States, and, and it keeps being um, reaffirmed over and over again over the last 50 years by the US Supreme Court, whether you agree with it or not, this is a protected right. And, and I think just understanding that, understanding that gun owners um, are incredibly responsible overall, that every time we hear these numbers, you know, millions, how many 40 million AR-15 style firearms, so-and-so quote unquote assault weapons are out there and all these high capacity quote unquote magazines and, and 100 million gunners. And yet we don't have a, a tragedy every minute. We don't have a, every gun owner getting involved in some negligence. We don't have uh, you know, 50% of gun owners committing suicide or committing a crime right. or anything. The numbers are incredibly small when you put them up against the raw ownership numbers and, and the owners, the, the number of guns that we all own. So I think that that idea that we have to keep coming back to is, is cultural competency, empathy, um, respect, acknowledgement of, of legitimacy of responsible gun ownership, and then finding ways to work, uh, again, with one another, but especially inside of the gun community. And I think that's something I, I'm very proud of inside the gun community. We've been a lot louder about risk mitigation, acknowledging the risks that come with firearms ownership and doing things that we've probably all been doing kind of in private. We're doing it very publicly now over the last decade. And I think that's incredibly important. And, and I hope that the other people, maybe on the other side of the issue, watching this panel or watching this entire conference might see more of that, um, acknowledge more of that and, and hopefully get excited about it. So we did some work, as you may know, Rob, with the National African American Gun Association on gun safety um, as well. Um, and the gun safety, the, as you said, there are um, uh, 400 million guns in this country. Gun safety is so important. So I just want to say thank you for the work you're doing. If people want to go, I'm not going to say ICE. If people want to go to ICE, your website, what is it, Rob? Uh, the best place to get information about everything we've talked about tonight is actually 2AO.org, Second Amendment Organization, um, ICE Training Company, ICETraining.us. If you're interested in a class, I, Matt, I'd love to get you into a class sometime. I'm coming, but let's uh, do it. Anywhere I'll in the world, right, including yeah. come to Illinois or North Carolina, where we have to do How about it. about Prague? I'm coming. <laughs> come on over. You know, they, they have, they're the only place with the, the civil right of gun ownership for defensive purposes written into their constitution. Now, the only other place besides the United States is right here. Great gun culture here. Fantastic. Rob, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so that was Rob Pincus from ICE, and now we're going to switch over to Timmy O from Vera in Albany, New York. Timmy, you uh, with me here? There you are. Oh, there you are, Timmy. So, Timmy, you, um, you have this company. It's super unique, what you do, uh, which is, do you have the product? Yep, I have it right here with me. So you have a uh, safe, a smart safe, right? Mm -hmm. And I just want to tell folks before you uh, before you say anything, Timmy, you can interrupt me at any time, but we're involved in Vera a bit. 
through an investment. Uh, and the reason why was because when we were researching the gun issue, we were finding out that stolen guns is such a big problem. People taking guns, for example, somebody gave the example of Atlanta Falcons football games, people would leave their guns in their cars, and they'd come back and their guns would be gone. And very, very, very often guns that are stolen are used in crimes. Not only are guns that are stolen used in crimes, they're often used in suicides as well. And so that's where you come in and your company. So why don't you tell us, Timmy, tell the audience a little bit about what you're doing. Yep. Thanks so much for having me, Matt, and for organizing this conference. So our my story kind of began, I grew up with firearms because my uncle was in the Los Angeles Police Department. So responsible training of a how to use a firearm, how to store a firearm was ingrained in my childhood. Um, as I went to over to uh, college for engineering, um, I found an interesting problem in the gun safety area where over 40 3% of firearms were left loaded and unsecured. And I found that really striking because of that safety lesson that was taught for me from a very young age of how to be responsible and secure. Um, what was even more interesting though, is when I went to the LAPD to conduct some research, even these highly trained officers uh, decided to keep their firearms loaded and unsecured. And it came down to the core reason of when they have a, especially a handgun by the bedside for protection, they want immediate access to it. And current solutions did not afford that access. So that's where we had the idea and came in of, can we leverage technology and just better product design and engineering to create a solution that can meet the needs of protection without giving up secure, safe, responsible storage? So the solution that we created back in 2019 was this product called the Reach Safe. Um, the way it works is, oops, sorry about that. So uh, as a quick, quick uh, picture on packaging, this is how the product's meant to be used. You can mount it next to your bedside table, under your desk, or even in the vehicle. Um, and as Rob Pink has mentioned, we are really proud to partner with Walk the Talk America, who's really advocating for uh, mental health and bridging the gap between mental health and gun owners. Timmy, what do you mean you're partnering with them? What does that What does that mean? So Mike Sedini has been an incredible mentor for us in guiding us in terms of not only how to communicate better in terms of mental health, uh, but just doing our parts in advocating for um, better mental health awareness, especially suicide prevention, since firearms are the most lethal mean. Um, but yeah, jumping right back to the product real quick to explain how it works. Uh, this here is my everyday concealed carry gun and it locks into this device, which is very similar to a holster. It takes up a little, a very small amount of space. The way it works is that when you want to unlock it, there's a fingerprint sensor right here. So as you reach out and grab it, immediate unlocks. So we've been able to innovate one of the most reliable and fastest biometric sensors in the market, which is what really drove our customers to use this technology, other than the fact that it's media access, it's just the reliability that we can finally afford for a uh, protective use. So since launch, launching in late 2019, we've been able to sell over 8,000 units and generated 2 million revenue. And there's one really exciting um, update I wanted to share as well during this conference is uh, Vara Safety was a finalist in the VA's uh, Mission Daybreak Challenge. And with the Veterans the, Administration, just so yeah, people know. Okay. Yep, the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. And over the eight over, over the course of the eight weeks of the accelerator, our team was actually able to build something that we've been really wanting to do over the last couple of years, which is a suicide prevention app. So now we're kind of segueing into this new technology that can integrate hopefully with all gun safes and affords a couple different options as a means of suicide prevention, especially for veterans, which has a high concentration. So how does this, how does that work? How does yep. the app? There's three features that we've been really testing and that's kind of where Rob Pincus, Mike Sedini, uh, Dr. Russell Lemley, a lot of clinicians have been coming together on a couple of different methods and tools that could be used uh, for suicide prevention with a firearm. One is which it's it's been shown that increasing time and space to a lethal means is a really important factor in preventing suicide. So one of them is a, a timeout delay that the gun owner can set and use when they are not feeling um, in a good state of mind. That is coupled with another feature called two-factor where now they can invite another uh, family or friend to help control access during a uh, set duration of time, like during when they're creating a safety plan. Wait, let me, let, Timmy, let me just try to go, let me just go over this with you because this is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, Cause I knew, I didn't know about this part. So I know obviously about the, the safe and the smart technology and all that. So you have an app on your phone, you're suffering from depression. You're able to set, put it in your phone to say, what's the time thing? How does it work exactly? How does it lock your gun? 
Yep. So the safe will just prevent any access for a set duration of time. Um, we were likely going to put in recommended amount of time, for example, like an hour. But once a start lockout mode is now initiated, uh, the gun owner is not able to access for it during that period, no matter what uh, they try to do. So and then but but let's say that period ends. Mm -hmm. So is it like a 10 day period or how to, it could be any? Yeah, it could be. Have on, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it could be any duration of time. The most important thing is that the sudden urge to attempt a suicide uh, comes on like kind of in waves. And that's kind of when the action period occurs. So if that's something that the user can feel uh, coming on, they're able to lock themselves out because increasing that time and distance uh, could save lives. Um, and then that's why it's that's one of the three features that we have, because I think it's a very complicated area of suicide prevention. People have different uh, human behavior responses to depression and anxiety and PTSD. Yeah. Um, so we we came up with a couple different solutions that we hope to test and see which one works. So then the friends part was the second part. What's the, explain if you could explain that part? Yeah, the friends one is essentially there is a current safety plan in place where, for example, um, a veteran going through counseling and understands that he has PTSD will actually take steps to remove the firearm out of the home. There is some complication with that in some states because there are laws against that. But we decided to implement the idea of what if the veteran can still keep the firearm in their home, which many of them really want to do because it's their property and their right. Um, and then now it affords them the ability to share that access control with their spouse, with a friend or partner yeah. that they trust. So that during a set duration of months, say during a month or two, they're like, I'm going to completely focus on myself, get 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 help. And during that time, I do not want access to my firearms. They will they're able to control that with their friend. Yeah. So now the third, mm -hmm, the third one's called reminder, because it's kind of what Rob just mentioned, where they put pictures of their loved ones on their safe. Yeah. So it's digitizing that where now a whole bunch of friends and family can upload like loved memories and videos to the a memory bank. And then whenever the gun owner goes to unlock that gun, their phone will be pinged with that message and it'll show up and it just um, creates a cycle that this person is still loved. There's a reason for them to live and all that help contribute to, to uh, decreasing an attempt of suicide. Amazing. And so in terms of the product itself, which is a very innovative product. You started this at a very young age, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you have an office up in the Albany area, right? Yep. And uh, and then you sell this to, you sell it online. And then do you sell it in, how does it work? How do people find you? Yeah, so for the past few years, we've been solely selling through uh, online direct. So through our website at varasafety.com. Um, as we expand into the next year, we are looking to get into more retail stores. We've been testing with a few over the last year. Um, and the best thing is we will be launching a new product called the Racked Rifle Safe, which is the same idea except now for rifles and shotguns. Um, and this is a prime candidate to be carried in retail stores. Was there some resistance to technology when you were starting, you said in 2019? And are you seeing that resistance wane as people get more used to the idea? Yeah, one of our biggest challenges when we first launched the product was that we were using a fingerprint sensor that was very similar to other competitors in the field, which honestly, unfortunately, wasn't too reliable. So as soon as we upgraded that with the Reach 2, um, we saw an immediate shift on how many people now were able to trust their lives with it. And since they were so comfortable, so they started spreading it via word of mouth. And that's when our sales started to skyrocket as well. Reach 2 is the name of the specifics um, safe. Yep, the, the newest one we have now, now is called the Reach 2S. Okay, and then where can I take that? Can you hold that up again, Tim? Yep. Do you mind holding it up? So I have that product. Mm -hmm. Where could I put that if I wanted it to be in a convenient place? Uh, that's the beauty of it. It's such a versatile, we have such a versatile mount that we have people mounting it next to their bed, behind their bed, if they want it kind of out of sight of their children, in their vehicle, um, in the closet. Um, the standard box safe is like this huge clunky, like 10 pound steel safe, even the smaller portable ones. So this now lets gun owners put wherever they want. Um, so we've seen that we've seen overall our goal was to increase the amount of people using safe storage, especially those who weren't. So we, we definitely are on route to achieving that goal. Amazing. And so uh, and the website, again, is Vara, V-A-R-A. -A, yep. Right. Safety is that yep, safety.com. Dot com. And you can get the product there. How much is it for one of those, Tim? Uh, for 
What a steal. That's amazing. Um, Timmy, thank you. Uh, the product is great. I hope everybody buys it. Um, I think it's fantastic. The work you're doing uh, to prevent suicides is obviously very necessary. So thank you. And that's, and by the way, you know, we talk about Timmy, this panel is supposed to be new ideas. This is a new fantastic idea. Um, so I hope people really buy the product. So thank you, Timmy. And thank you to all of our panelists. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with Stephanie Feldman from the Biden administration.